Thanks, uh, Daniel. I'm pleased to be here for a whole number of reasons. I was here visiting Daniel a couple of years ago, and the weather was just like this. So when I, when I remember Neuchâtel, this is what I remember. Kind of <laughs> fog in the morning, but nice moderate weather, nice sun in the afternoon. Seems like a very nice place to live. Uh, I've got a cold, which I caught on a trip last week, um, so my voice may not uh, be the best, but I'm certainly pleased to be here. So as Daniel mentioned, 50 years is the anniversary of when the Department of Earth Sciences at Waterloo started. And they started with four geologists uh, in 65, and, uh, and then they decided to go into hydrogeology, uh, and I arrived there in 71. They decided to do hydrogeology in 1970, and so when I arrived, there were four hydrogeologists, including myself. So that was a big group back in uh, 1971. But um, as, as 50 years is also the anniversary of the first course I took that mentioned groundwater contamination, uh, surprisingly. Where am I here? Um, and uh, probably the reason why uh, that course at the University of Illinois, which was a civil engineering course on water pollution, mentioned groundwater contamination at all, was likely because of this book, which is really the book that started the environmental movement uh, in North America. Uh, an amazing book by an amazing woman. If you haven't read it, uh, it's, it's a really a, a, good, a good read about her book and, and her life. And she brought the attention to the attention of the United States of are really the consequences of, of chemical agriculture uh, uh, in, in a big way. And she actually had a number of pages in her book on groundwater contamination. So um, my introduction to anything to do with groundwater contamination was in that course. And there were only, I guess, three weeks of lectures on the course. And one was by a professor who was interested in the movement of radioactive uh, elements. And I'll mention that in a moment. And the other professor was interested in the dispersion of organic matter, in, in basically in surface water. So in that course, I learned about strontium-90 and cesium-137, which is, was an important topic at the era. And I learned about dispersion and something called the dispersion coefficient. I also learned that the view, if there was a view at all, um, uh, of the groundwater world was that it would assimilate. Uh, and uh, groundwater contamination really wasn't a, wasn't a problem, but the, the general view of life back at that time was that we in society could put pretty well whatever we want into the environment, and the environment would simulate it to a, to a good degree, particularly when it, when it came to uh, groundwater. And, and so the world we live in then, and when it comes to groundwater, we move back and forth between believing in assimilation capacity and then being very concerned about some contaminant that might arrive in uh, at a part per billion or whatever. So we're kind of schizophrenic now. So assimilation involves attenuation, and attenuation has become the popular word, but uh, uh, simulation refers to the, the, the bigger picture. And we can refer to assimilation capacity, um, which some people should w tell me is not a word we should use, because if you, if you mention capacity, it implies that you can actually measure it. Uh, and assimilation capacity isn't something that we define or ever try to measure, but it's likely that we should have, and it's likely that we should uh, in the future, even though it's kind of a nebulous topic. And back in the early 60s, there were some hydrogeologists, one by the name of Harry Legrand at the USGS that I met in his later years and had very nice conversations with. And Harry Legrand uh, published the first paper uh, in a, in a peer-reviewed journal on groundwater contamination. He published the first paper on plumes in water resources research in 1965, issue number one. And he had no data and he had no mathematics, but he published a whole paper on plumes. And the whole thing was intuitive. What a wonderful time it would have been to be able to publish papers where you didn't have to have all that much data. And you didn't have to have models. But anyway, I'll just let you read these sentences here. And uh, so, in fact, way back then, his intuition was, was correct. Most things that we put in the ground uh, don't do any harm. Uh, but there are serious aspects uh, of harm when we don't, we don't get it uh, quite right. So the start of quantitative contaminant hydrogeology began in the 50s. And as I'll show you in a moment, amazing work was done in the 50s, work that was well ahead of its time, work that you could publish today. Um, it was done so well, but nobody ever heard of it because it was done in the nuclear industry, 
by people who didn't consider themselves really to be hydrogeologists or uh, they weren't part of the geoscience world. And so there were publications coming out uh, based on work done in the 50s uh, in the United States uh, and, and in Canada, and I'll show you the Canadian ones. And so what was the big, what was the big interesting groundwater contamination in, in the 1950s because of radioactivity? It's because basically most of the initial small nuclear reactors that people built for, as they headed towards figuring out how to produce a power uh, melted down. So the Canadian reactors melted down fairly routinely in the first while. And they were small reactors and they were blowing up and whatnot. But when they melted down, then they would basically flood the reactor basement with water and then they'd have to get rid of it. And this happened basically at a whole variety of places across the world. Uh, and uh, so the radioactive water was gotten rid of wherever it, you know, basically out the door. <coughs> and uh, when I was in high school in, in Ottawa, our capital city, we would hear about this place uh, called the Chalk River Nuclear Labs. And it was, we wouldn't hear about it very much because it was, it was not really in front of the public, but it was where we Canadians were establishing our, our uh, nuclear power uh, research facility. And it's about two and a half hours from Ottawa now on good highways. And at that time, it was basically out in the bush. And uh, so when the reactors melted down, uh, they would pump all the water out into pits. And fortunately, they had sand. So it was a very good operation. They could basically just pump it out in the sand uh, and, uh, and it would basically disappear into the ground. Um, and uh, so a year or two or so later, I, they figured out they'd better uh, have a look to see where it's going because the, this is only a two or three kilometers from the Ottawa River, which runs through the city of Ottawa. So they hired a British geotechnical engineer from Imperial College to come over uh, and figure out what's going on. And his name was Peter Parsons, and he arrived and did this marvelous work without any preconceived notions that would come from, from, uh, from water well hydrogeology or, or any of that. And preconceived notions can, can set one uh, back. So he didn't have any. Um, and he was an engineer who, who was well trained in geotechnical sampling, etc. And he stayed in Canada for about 10 years. Basically, he did his job and, and went back to the UK. But one of the beauties of strontium-90 and cesium-137, et cetera, is they absorb quite well onto just about anything. So to get a data point, to get a concentration, all that you have to do is get a, get a sample of your aquifer, your sand, and put it in a counting machine, and you have your, your numbers. So it's, it's, it was a really a nice type of contaminants to deal with, nice in terms of, of being able to do the analysis. And, um, and what they found was that the fission products, the strontium niacine and cesium-137 and cobalt, etc., didn't move very fast at all compared to the water or compared to the tritium. People weren't worried about the tritium. They were worried about the fission products. Um, and so they set forth then to take a bunch of samples, basically just to go out and look for these plumes. And they would go out uh, and uh, basically drill holes and take samples at intervals of, uh, of uh, 10 or 20 centimeters. And one thing about contaminant hydrogeology when you're looking for contaminants, in, 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 at least in the early years, we didn't know what intervals we would need to sample at. And that's caused lots of, lots of confusion. Uh, in their, their case, they didn't know what intervals to sample at, but they basically went out and sampled at the smallest intervals that one can imagine and found exactly where these plumes were. And this is just one example. Uh, going from the pit where they disposed in 1954 uh, to the front of the plume. And this is probably one of the world's most uh, detailed plume delineations. They know where that front of this plume is within a meter or so. Isn't that amazing? So we could say that high resolution, very sophisticated contaminant hydrogeology got going in Canada, in the Canadian bush uh, in the 1950s. The problem was that the, these reports were published, but you'd never find them. Uh, and only one or two papers were published in the most obscure places in the IA. Uh, International Atomic Energy Agency sort of communications, etc. This this wonderful stuff remained totally buried uh, to the the research community, and uh, I discovered it in the early 70s when I worked at this particular facility with students for a number of years. So uh, in the U.S., they did interesting things. They didn't do field delineations of plumes very much, but they looked at the concept of dispersion and found the transport equation and. 
In 1960, there's this famous uh, paper, or USGS paper, with a one-dimensional solution to the advection dispersion equation. Okay, the advection dispersion equation, which you take courses on, on groundwater contamination, you'll get to know and love, or know or, or know and hate. Um, Beitzley was, a, I think, a physicist or a chemical engineer working in, in Belgium, and then he published papers kind of on the three-dimensional version of, of, uh, of contaminant migration. So in the 50s and 60s, we learned how to map plumes in great detail. Well, we, they did. Nobody knew about it. Uh, and there was a mathematical basis established then for, for looking at, at how contaminants move in porous media. So I guess the key points here is that cationic radionuclides uh, retard, so the retardation uh, factor came from that, uh, and uh, early on we learned uh, uh, about high resolution methods, but it went unknown, and the mathematical principles uh, were established. Now in the 50s and 60s, um, starting in California, it was kind of decided that, that household garbage shouldn't just be thrown into dumps. And there were dumps developing all over uh, North America, uh, it's because there was lots of land. Uh, and engineers, sanitary engineers, which is what they were called at that time, decided there would be something called a sanitary landfill. Okay, and a sanitary landfill wasn't a dump. It was a, a, a place on the earth that you would choose for, for good reasons, and you would dig a pit, and you would do it in an organized way. But it still meant then that the garbage would go into pits, uh, and, and the expectation was then that the leachate from the garbage uh, would be attenuated. Uh, this is a left-hand plume, I think. I don't know where this diagram came from, but, uh, but it, the person must be left-handed and, and hadn't learned the, <laughs> and they had, the person hadn't learned the rules on drawing plumes. Plumes are right-handed. Okay, they have to go from left to right. And I'm left-handed, but I've learned how to live in a right-handed world, so I draw my plumes properly. So this was the idea. You'd put your garbage in the ground well above the water table, uh, and you'd get uh, attenuation in the Vado zone, and you'd get a bunch more attenuation uh, in the groundwater zone if you located your landfill uh, properly so that you could get att that attenuation. And in fact, this concept worked extremely well. It worked extremely well until people began to look for, for basically chlorinated, chlorinated compounds, chlorinated solvents. This approach to landfilling takes care of almost all metals and, 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 and everything else except these trace uh, organics that are mobile. <clears throat> and this uh, talk I, I gave in an International Association of Hydrogeology meeting in, in Waterloo uh, then yesterday, seems like a long time ago, yesterday morning, uh, and there were 350 people in the room, members of the Canadian IAH, uh, amazing, and they were turning people away. So we've gone from Canada having no hydrogeologists and in, in basically in, uh, in uh, 1965 or so, I guess maybe there might have been two or three, uh, into, uh, into have, being able to have big meetings. And in mid-September, uh, uh, as was Daniel and some others here, we attended an IH meeting in Rome, uh, a very wonderful meeting with uh, 850 or 950 pe people there. So hydrogeology as a science has, has kind of grown over the decades and kind of has arrived as a respectable science that's international. Uh, and and uh, and whatnot. Uh, so, um, in, from the work published uh, by the U.S. Geological Survey, based on work done in the 70s, looking at landfill plumes, uh, this would is an example of what they would say: organic carbon was found in concentrations as high as etc., but attenuated rapidly to less than 20 milligrams per liter. And this day and age, we would look on at, uh, in, in shock uh, in shock at 20 milligrams per liter. But basically, the world was unfolding at this time as it was unfolding in rivers and lakes and whatnot and so forth, where attenuation was more or less taking care of things if you didn't know about a variety of the contaminants that we know about now. So um, I'll get to how I got into this field here in, in a moment. But when I moved from the University of Manitoba, where I was for four years, uh, and I went there as my first academic position, I w arrived at the University of Waterloo. And I've been doing research for the nuclear industry, and when I arrived in Ontario, they invited me to go up to the Chalk River Nuclear Labs. So it took until 1971 for me to discover all this uh, marvelous work up there, and then we began, to we began to restudy those plumes. And the plumes were just like they were, more or less in the same place then, uh, a couple of decades later. 
So I uh, then, at the invitation of our federal government, began to study a plume uh, on a Canadian military force base called Canadian uh, Forces Base Borden, the so-called Borden site. And I went out there to try and find the plume in a sand aquifer, and of course, what I realized I needed to do was to do high resolution uh, delineation. Now, the, the, the standard way of going about groundwater contamination sampling for a long time, and it still is in some places, is to put in some monitoring wells, generally not many, uh, two or three, uh, and call that a, a monitoring location, and that would be a monitoring well a cluster. And the alternative way, if you want to get high resolution, is to put something in the ground that allows you to sample at many different depths. And the something in the ground in some aquifers can be really simple. It can just be some pipe that you strap some tubes around and you tape it all together and you drill your hole and you shove it in the ground. And in the right type of aquifer where you don't have to worry about seals and all that, then that gets you high resolution data. So on the right hand or left hand side here, your right hand side, uh, we have a version of that that we used uh, to delineate this landfill plume. This has become a famous plume because uh, my colleagues at Waterloo got involved and we had about five or six professors involved and many graduate students and we spent several years studying one landfill poem at a, on a military base, we just studied it to death. And we published it all in the Journal of Hydrology in 1983, a whole collection of papers and that volume is highly cited. Uh, mostly I think because it was early but, but uh, more so I think because it integrated all the disciplines uh, geophysics and had geology and hydrogeology and geochemistry and had some isotope work. And that's when groundwater science is fun. So here we have uh, a version of this plume, I think in 1975. So there you see it. And what we're looking at then is uh, chloride. And it's a nice, well behaved plume. Uh, the, the, uh, the leachate sinks. Okay, that's a very important point. It sinks even though the chloride concentrations are not all that, not all that high. Uh, and and uh, back in that era when we saw the plume was sinking, like it doesn't really have all that much chloride. And that's when I real, realized that it doesn't take much of a total dissolved solids contrast uh, and time then to, to allow plumes to do a good job of sinking. And I'll get back to this plume uh, in a moment. Okay, so if we look at this diagram, uh, uh, and we'll get back to it in a moment though. There's implications for transverse dispersion, even though, even though the evidence uh, wasn't uh, all that clear to me for reasons I'll get to in a moment. But we'll, we'll, leave, we'll leave porous media here, and we'll go to when I started my work in this field. I arrived um, uh, actually back from a postdoc in France. I was in France for nine months. Uh, trying to learn about groundwater geochemistry at the University of Bordeaux, where there was a very elderly professor who was actually a world leader in groundwater geochemistry, Henri Cholaire. And he wrote a book, I think it was published in about that time, called Les Eaux Souterrains. And I was fluent when I left Bordeaux, but I'm not fluent now, and that's why I'm lecturing in English. Um, but anyway, I got back from Bordeaux, and, and uh, I was invited to study uh, the radioactive disposal uh, ground at our second Canadian uh, nuclear uh, research facility, which is much smaller. And it's located there, um, as we can see on this map. And they also were developing uh, reactors, a different type of reactor. Their reactors weren't melting down because they, they, uh, they uh, had learned how to do it and they didn't start building reactors until about, uh, until about 63 or 64. But they had radioactive waste that was going in the ground. And so I spent the first few years of my, uh, shall we say, contaminant hydrogeology career with graduate students studying just a, just a hectare or two here out in the, in the middle of this flat-lying land uh, not far from a river. And uh, this little plot of land was used for about 20 years to dispose low and intermediate level waste. So not the really bad stuff, but just the, you know, just the, well, some of it was pretty bad, but... Um, Everything from just slightly radioactive garbage up to just about everything else, everything else except the spent fuel. And in the summertime, it would look uh, like the photograph over on your right, uh, nice and dry, and they had these concrete bunkers and they had all sorts of other things and whatnot, all of which uh, leaked. Um, but at least in the summertime, when you looked at it, you wouldn't see any water. And that's the way it was supposed to be. The engineers who chose this site thought that uh, basically water wasn't going to be an issue, that they wouldn't see any. 
And in the springtime, of course, you see lots of water. And these are bags of slightly radioactive waste that are kind of floating there. Uh, and the water's all a little bit radioactive, and, 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 and the plants are all a bit radioactive, etc. Now, this is not a big problem at all. It's just a small problem that can illustrate uh, uh, all sorts of things that are interesting. So my job was to go out there and, uh, and find out what was going on. Um, and they had lots of research money for me, but my immediate reaction was, well, why would I, would why would I want to do that? Like, why would I want to sacrifice what I hoped was going to be a decent career for studying a topic that seemed, seemed like nobody would ever be interested in it? Uh, but it was nearby, and they had research money to support students, so we, we began. And I didn't have the slightest idea how to begin, but I asked one of my colleagues, Bob Farbolden, who started the, the, the Waterloo Group, uh, I said, what, what do you think I should do? He said, well, when in doubt, go and drill a hole in the ground and put pipe in the hole, but, uh, but slot the bottom part of the pipe, cut, cut slots in the bottom part of the pipe, and lower it in the hole and pour some sand around it. Uh, and then once you've got the sand around the slots in the pipe, then you should pour in cement. And it's important not to pour the cement around the slots. Um, and so that's what we did, and I think that's, that's what I've really been doing for the last many decades. <laughs> when in doubt, drill holes and put pipe in them. Now, the reason why the, uh, the uh, pits were dry in the summertime and wet in the springtime was that the clay was all fractured. And when the engineers studied this site, they took samples of clay, and it's a very plastic clay, and they took it back to the lab, and they did standard geotechnical tests whereby you apply stress to the sample, and when you do that, you close all the fractures, and you find that the sample doesn't have any permeability for all practical purposes. So when they chose this site, they thought they were going to be digging pits into, uh, into impervious uh, clay. And of course, that, they obviously hadn't talked to a geoscientist and, and considered things like weathering, etc. But the water table goes up and down like a yo-yo because the thing is riddled with weathering, with root holes uh, and fractures, and the fractures caused by des are desiccation, uh, and they're there. And so the question we asked then, well, how deep do the fractures go? And the presumption was that the fractures wouldn't go very deep because the clay is plastic. And you would think when you get down at a, you know, at a depth of six, seven meters or so that the, that the fractures would be closed because you have overburden weight and, and, and what and so forth. But the question was, well, are the fractures closed or open? And this is the situation. Uh, so basically, they chose a site where they had silt and clay and clay glacial till. And they would dig those pits down to about five or six meters and, and just uh, uh, put it in uh, to their, their containers. And so my intent then was to uh, go out and drill holes. And we would install then uh, these uh, uh, piezometer uh, clusters. Uh, each hole had a separate pipe, etc., and we had many of them, and we mapped this flow system in excruciating detail, studied the geochemistry and, and all, all sorts of things. But the issue of the moment here then uh, is, uh, is uh, learning about fractures. So we, we pumped a well here, and we observed all of those piezometers to see what we would observe. And, and basically, uh, if you see no response, like in the DAS graph, then you've learned that you don't have any hydraulic connection from the aquifer up through the clay. And if you see a response, then you know you have hydraulic connection. And a 25-foot uh, piezometer here is on top of the sand, and it responds very quickly to pumping. And this pumping test lasted a, a month or so. And one of the 13-foot uh, piezometers then also responded. So that tells us uh, automatically then that there's a direct hydraulic connection up through the aquitard, and the only way we can explain that is that, the, is that there are open fractures. If we'd seen no responses, then all that we would have been able to conclude was that we didn't see any response, and therefore we didn't have any piezometers in fractures. So it's one of these examples in geoscience where you can, you can uh, prove uh, the positive, but you can't prove the, dis the negative, etc. So that led me on a lifelong... Uh, um, uh, interest uh, in fractures. And they're everywhere. And if you have a thick deposit of clay or shale and you want to bury radioactive waste in it and whatnot, uh, then your challenge is to prove that fractures aren't there. And if you can do that, then you've basically uh, established that the deposit is, uh, is, uh, is suitable for entombment of waste. And many years later, well, a few years later, we went back uh, with a colleague uh, and we're, we're, we're digging out a large cylinder because we're not going to make the mistakes that the geotechnical engineers made by taking samples that are too small. We're going to take a big sample. 
the biggest sample that we thought we could get back to a lab. Uh, and we spent many days in this pit, whatnot, and I found it very interesting. And we would, we would see the fractures, and this is a fracture that has a gray surface and it's got root holes along it. It's got, it's got paleo root imprints. And so fractures can be permeable just because they're open, but they can also be even more permeable because they can have basically paleo roots and things like that. Um, so fractures are, are uh, very interesting. So we took this big column out and, and Jerry took it back to a lab in Alberta where he was working and he got it all set up and he, he ran water through it and various solutes through it. And he published a paper, a couple of papers in Water Resources Research, which is a very good journal. Um, but we couldn't claim in these papers that this column had anything, anything directly to do with, in fact, this clay in the ground because we couldn't claim that the fractures hadn't opened by stress release and all of that. All we could claim is we've got a column with some fractures in it that may be, may be made by us or not, uh, and that we got very interesting results. I'll get back to this in a moment. Oh, and then we gave up column experiments. The collusion was all my land. It, you know, if you dig out a big thing and you do your best job and you take it back to the lab and you can't claim that you've got something simulating the field, then that's not, a, that's not an endeavor worth doing. And we would never go there again. Um, but other people did, and they did it uh, well. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now. So groundwater science was developing in the 60s and 70s. And a person who became my good colleague at the University of Waterloo, Robert Gillum, one of the most highly cited uh, groundwater researchers in, in the world, uh, did a master's thesis at the University of Guelph in 1969. And Guelph was just uh, 30 kilometers down the highway from Waterloo. Uh, and Bob was from a farm, and he was interested in that. So he basically drilled holes in a, in a, in a barnyard uh, and put pipe in it to see what he could learn about nitrogen. And he, later on then, he, with, with me involved, but he did the thinking, uh, we did some field studies in an area of very heavy uh, agricultural use on a sandy aquifer um, a few hours southwest of Waterloo, and, he, and, and we published them the first paper on denitrification. So before that, there was no evidence in the literature that your nitrate going into the ground can be lost by denitrification. And we didn't do that by deciding that we would go out and find evidence for denitrification. We would never have gotten a research grant for that. We would never have gotten a research grant for that because, in fact, there was no evidence there would ever be denitrification. And generally, you don't get research money for, to take questions for which there's no evidence. Like in general, it's got to be a problem. Uh, so you don't get money to study a non-problem or a parent non-problem. Anyway, that was the first paper on, on denitrification. Uh, and then Bob went ahead and, and published uh, another paper or two on that. Uh, and that whole field of denitrification then uh, has opened up and is a very interesting hydrogeochemical microbial field. It's one thing as a hydrogeologist to find out that denitrification occurs. And it's, a, it's another thing to figure out why it occurs. Like what's driving it? Where are the bacteria? What are they eating? What's the form of the organic matter and all of that? Um, and to do that, you've got to put more than, more than pipe in the ground. Now, in, in the 60s and early 70s then, other people were studying other topic. And there was a German hydrogeologist by the name of Frederick Schrilly who published really good stuff on petroleum contamination in groundwater. So in the 1960s, there were very good papers on controlling petroleum contamination of groundwater. The science had developed quite well, mostly because in Europe, after the, after the war, there were so many people that had uh, a fuel oil tanks, I gather, that fuel oil leaks in the ground was very common, and, and in private uh, wells were common. So the situation was set up in some European countries that, such that if there was going to be petroleum leaking in the ground, you would, you would know about it. So um, I'm told that this uh, uh, paper, Contaminant Hydrogeology, Part 1, Physical Processes, by myself and Bob Gillum and John Pickens, I'm told that it's a landmark paper, not because of what's in the paper, uh, but for the title. Uh, and the, the, the subject contaminant hydrogeology now, we kind of know what it means, and there's been a book written about it, and there are courses taught on it. Uh, and so by the mid-70s then, I guess we decided that we'll use this term contaminant hydrogeology to signal to the world that there's a, a part of our science out there that's, uh, that's identifiable. And in Europe, there was a book called Groundwater Pollution by a, for a person called Fried, and he died early, and so we didn't hear any more from him in the literature, but he published a whole book 
uh, a French scientist on groundwater pollution. And there was other great stuff being published in Europe. And I think Europe was the leader on, uh, in basically in contaminant hydrogeology up, in, up into that period. Now, uh, uh, the advection dispersion equation. So now we're going to look at dispersion for a moment. Uh, and if you want to quantify uh, contaminant migration then, at least in that era and even now, you usually would, would use the so-called advection dispersion equation, which I think is shown on the next slide incorrectly. Uh, it's like the parcel differentials aren't right here, but don't, don't worry about that. We're looking at the bottom equation. So here we have this, the this dispersion coefficient in the longitudinal direction and equals alpha, which is dispersivity, times the velocity of the groundwater plus the, plus the molecular diffusion coefficient. Okay, so the molecular diffusion coefficient is in here uh, because that's the way it, it happens when you develop the equation. So we can't say that diffusion isn't, uh, isn't, uh, it wasn't known back in this period. It was known because it was embedded in the formula for the diffusion coefficient, all of which, all of which is wrong. In other words, it, it's, a math, it's one of those mathematical equations that, in fact, was what people had available. Okay, and so it became the governing mathematics for this particular field. Uh, I'm basically being wrong, and I'll get to that in a moment. Wrong in the sense that it doesn't represent uh, nature. No, it can represent nature, but the dis dispersion coefficient then is a parameter. Like, like many engineering models, it becomes a parameter that you can just adjust and make it, and make it fit. It doesn't mean you can predict with it. So just to remind you about dispersion, there's dispersion in the longitudinal direction. Your plume mixes in the direction it's going. And then there's transverse dispersion, where the, the mixing uh, basically causes contaminants to move outside of the stream tube. And so your plume is going along like that, and it's, it's mixing. It's going outside of the stream tube in, in the transverse directions. Okay, and that's transverse dispersion. It's the important dispersion coefficient. So here's a, yet another uh, diagram of this Borden plume. We publish many of them. Just you know, we use a different diagram for a different year or whatever. And this was uh, uh, then published in 82, but it was done in the late 70s. And in the next slide, it's going to show that area in detail here. So here's the front of this plume. And we have a clean water, which is oxidizing, overlying the plume, which is reducing. And the plume has iron in it, and it has manganese in it. And like it's a reducing plume. Uh, and there's a very sharp interface between the water on top of the plume and the plume itself. In fact, uh, a few months ago, students from Guelph were out at this site studying something else. And they sampled one of these, these multi-level systems, and it looks exactly the same. Looks exactly the same like 30-some uh, like years later. Um, anyway, so there's a very sharp interface there. So what's that telling us? Okay, that's telling us then that vertical transverse dispersion is very small. And in fact, that interface, the, the more detailed you sample it, the sharper the interface gets. Uh, and and uh, that raises the issue, how detailed does your sampling have to be in general? And, and it depends on your problem, it depends on your hydrogeology, but the, generally the answer is when you start, you don't know. So you go out and you get some data, and you're hoping that you're get, getting data at the right scale. And most data gathered in this field, contaminant hydrogeology, is gathered at, at not the right scale, not the right scale to identify the processes uh, that are likely operating. Now, the, the, uh, the mathematical community uh, got really excited uh, back in the 60s when people realized that with digital computers, you could use numerical methods and you could uh, produce models then that were much more powerful than these analytical solutions. And my colleague, Alan Fries, who co-authored the textbook with me, his PhD thesis was basically a finite uh, difference a model steady state of groundwater flow systems, and he published that in the 60s and won awards for it, and was considered to be a really big deal, which is what, which it, what, which it was. And that was on groundwater flow. And George Pinder, a colleague, a co-student with me at the University of Illinois, also a Canadian, uh, joined, uh, basically his PhD thesis was, was developing a, a, the first, one of the first numerical models to simulate contaminant transport. Okay, and that's much harder. Okay, that's much harder than simulating groundwater flow. And one of George's first papers then was simulating a chromium plume 
mapped on Long Island uh, and published in 1964. So George got his model running and was giving him all sorts of nice colored pictures and whatnot that looked reasonable and he needed some field data to, to uh, verify the model. Okay? Not calibrate the model but verify the model. And he basically then showed that he could run his model and he could basically duplicate the plume. And he published that all with great fanfare and went on and so forth. And people got the impression then, well, you really didn't need to get much field data. All you need to do is, is fire up a big model and, and, and you could do wonderful things with it. Um, and, and this entire paper is nothing more than numerical nonsense. As it, turns out, as it turns out, the model had so much numerical dispersion that in fact the dispersion coefficients he was putting in, even though they were wrong, were overwhelmed by the numerical dispersion. And a very interesting lesson there that the numerical people hadn't properly, shall we say, ground truth their models against analytical solutions, etc., because enthusiasm was so great. We all were very, very enthusiastic, including myself. So here we have this book that, that uh, is still in print and people are still using it around the world, and which made me uh, famous. And uh, it's still a good book, except for the parts that are wrong. And uh, one of the parts, one of the parts, parts that are wrong because science has moved forward and the book had the wrong paradigm. So this book, when I picked it up to prepare for this lecture, uh, whatnot, I reread the dispersion part and I said, oh my, yeah, and I kind of remembered it, but I haven't looked at that chapter in a long time because I knew it was going to be annoying. Um, and I figured, oh my land, it, 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 the, the chapter was published uh, when the paradigm was shifting, like it was published right in the middle of a paradigm shift. Um, and so a student and a professor at Waterloo uh, in 1976 had, had developed their version of a numerical model for solid transport. And we were pretty sure that it was better than the Pinder model because this model was finite elements and the Pinder model was finite difference and who, who knows and whatnot, but, but we were really impressed with this one. And John Pickens, who then became, uh, uh, who, who, this was a master's thesis, then became my PhD thesis, at uh, Waterloo, produced diagrams like this, where you basically put in a longitudinal dispersion coefficient and you put in a transverse dispersion coefficient and you do a sensitivity analysis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when you look at these diagrams and whatnot and so forth, they spread the plume basically throughout with, with uh, they spread the plume throughout the vertical thickness uh, of the aquifer very easily. Okay, and of course that makes no sense in terms of that, that uh, diagram of the Borden landfill that we carefully mapped. So it was a paradigm shift and I'd forgotten what the, what the Borden plume was trying to tell me. What the Borden plume was trying to tell me was that vertical transverse dispersion is very, very small. Okay, and what I didn't and connect was that these transverse dispersion coefficients they were putting in this model, and I was part of this, they were putting in the model then uh, were basically not based on anything to do with what you'd ever see in nature. And so there was a long period in there where, where, where George Pinder uh, and, uh, and others, uh, and, and even people at Waterloo, were basically using these numerical models uh, producing uh, numerical nonsense. And, uh, uh, and in fact, it wasn't until Emil Friend, uh, the modeling professor at Waterloo in her sciences, who came from Germany to Canada when he was 20 and got a PhD from the University of Toronto uh, in, in structural engineering. And we hired him as our uh, numerical specialist because there were no uh, numerical specialists to hire at that time who'd done groundwater. And I went to Emil and said, Emil, you know, this, this is, we've got lots of nonsense going on here. You need to do something. So Emil worked very hard on that. And it took him several years to basically take the same models and all that stuff, but to get it so that you could actually do your, your, grid, your, grid, your grid work and, and your, your timing so you could get rid of the numerical dispersion. And so about 10 years later then, Emil and a student properly simulated this plume. Um, and that's kind of how the science, science goes. You move forward and you see something, but you don't quite understand it, and you develop a models and you get those going and whatnot and so forth, and, and eventually there becomes a clarity. All right. So, um, so we're studying this Borden landfill and, and uh, getting interested in dispersion right, right in, in, in the mid to late 70s. And the conclusion, and dispersion, there were more people, more academics studying dispersion than just about any other topic around because it's a neat topic, it's a global topic. It's got a literature. If you publish something in it, you can be cited, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and so it was uh, really got kind of out of hand. Um, so so I, I was wondering, well, what are we going to do 
there's all sorts of conflicting views. There were the views that dispersion coefficients grow with, with time and distance. And that's a little bit true. They grow a little bit, but not much with time and distance, etc. They grow by, by, by diffusion, not by, not by dispersion. So we decided to go out to the Borden Aquifer and uh, when in doubt, when in doubt, drill a hole in the ground uh, and put a pipe in it. But in contaminant hydrogeology, when in doubt, take your contaminant, go out in the field and put it in the ground and see how it functions, see what happens to it. But, but to get the real good stuff out of your experiment, you have to do it on, with the groundwater flowing at a natural rate. So my master's student, Ed Siddiqui, who's now one of the world's most famous uh, modelers, he was a master's student at that time, he had the job of going out to Borden. And I said, Ed, go out to Borden and, and basically pump in some chloride salt uh, and monitor it. See what's going to happen. So basically, it's an experiment without a hypothesis. Okay, go out to Borden and went on and so forth and monitor. Well, you, what's a hypothesis? The hypothesis will learn something about dispersion, but that's not a real hypothesis. So basically, we're going on a fishing trip. Uh, and and uh, so that was a very successful experiment. And I was on sabbatical at Stanford writing the Freeze Cherry book in 1975, and I got to know the Stanford people well. And, and we decided that we jointly should round up money, Canadian American money, and do, it, and do a definitive tracer experiment, natural gradient at Canadian Forces Base Borden with a, with a joint team. And this is a Stanford technician pumping into the Borden aquifer chloride and bromide to do a dispersion experiment, but also pumping in some chlorinated organic compounds, uh, tetrachloroethylene and, and uh, I think benzene, etc., uh, to see what they would do. And the Borden sand is about a homogeneous sand as you can find in this world. And if you test it hydraulically, it's homogeneous. But if you look at it from the point of view of contaminant behavior, it can be very heterogeneous. So the hydraulics operates at one scale and the contaminants operate at another scale. And so we, uh, we, this is our monitoring network and in each one of these uh, white pipes, there's a, a pipe, a uh, PVC pipe with some uh, Teflon tubing strapped to it. This is Emil Friend coming out to see the field, and that's how we monitor. So each one of those white pipes then has a dozen monitoring points. Okay, and this is what we found. We pumped in the slug. The slug moves along, and after a year and a half, the slug's gone, you know, 50 meters or so, and it's just about the same vertical height uh, as it was when it was pumped in. So that means then that there's hardly any vertical transverse dispersion. Over 50 meters, uh, over over a, you know a year and a half. Now that's the way it should be because that's what the Borden landfill plume was, was showing us. So well, the only thing we've added to this story here is that we've done it in a very controlled way, and we can look at all the dispersions uh, and uh, have have no doubt. Now Ed Siddiqui uh, used the data from the Stanford Waterloo experiment for his PhD thesis. That was his job. His job was to basically take his wonderful knowledge of stochastics and whatnot and simulate the plume. And he did that, and this is apparently the most highly cited paper in the entire field of contaminant hydrogeology. Apparently it's got more than 700 citations. So what does that mean? It means that it's likely a very good paper, but what it means even more so is that there's a very big readership uh, about anything to do with dispersion and sound and gravel aquifers. And now we have the question, uh, do we now know all we need to know about dispersion in Santa Graal aquifers? And in North America, I think we've, we've decided that that's the case. We know enough. Now, the USGS then uh, uh, came to see us, uh, and uh, Dennis LeBlanc from that organization uh, out of the East Coast then did a very similar experiment. They basically did the same experiment, took them longer, cost them more money, uh, and indeed they did it in a different type of aquifer. Okay. It's sand. Uh, it's alluvial sand, etc. So if there's any sand that looks more heterogeneous uh, than the Borden sand, it would be this one. Heterogeneous within, within, a, within a realm of, of sand, you know, and coarse sand into fine gravel. And they did it with a different type of multi-level device, okay? But it's the same old game. Take a bunch of tubes and put them in the ground. Okay, whoa, look at, look at this. So, I mean, the USGS is a large organization. They can perform like an army, so they could kind of do this test sample thousands and thousands of points and do it over years and one and so forth. So by the time they did their test and we did this, uh, one test and another test was done in Mississippi, nobody in North America would ever want to do any of these tests again. They're so tedious. And so what did the USGS uh, find? They found the same thing that we found, 
basically very weak dispersion. Dispersion that basically is so weak that you, you can conclude that your monitoring probably isn't even fine enough if you wanted to actually get it down to the last, to the last uh, decimal point. And this is a map view then. So you pump in your slug and it turns into a, into a pencil. And, and uh, this uh, is a, a totally unsighted paper in the literature. Whenever I go through to see how papers are being cited or not, I'm always amazed. It's usually the papers that I think they're most important that nobody's, nobody's reading. Uh, and this is one of them. Uh, and it's a 10 kilometer long plume uh, of basically a chloride uh, from a prison outside of Regina, Saskatchewan. So how would you ever find such a plume and whatnot and so forth? Well, Garth Vanderkamp, which is one of the, who's one of the great groundwater scientists in, in Canada, and at the IH meeting, uh, Garth was honored. Uh, Garth was looking at some data 10 kilometers away from the Regina jail back some decades ago and noticed the start of a breakthrough curve. And these, these were just monitoring wells sitting out there to monitor the Zachary, spaced very, very sparsely. Garth was looking at the data and he noticed something strange, that the chloride was rising. It's like, what would that be? Uh, and then he tracked it back and found that the only place you could get some chloride that would cause that would be a, would be a prison. Okay, with, with uh, laundry facilities and all of that located 10 kilometers away. And then I p assigned a graduate student to it and we mapped it in, in enough detail to conclude that this is a 10 kilometer long then chloride tracer experiment that basically is very consistent with what we know about dispersion from these very smaller scale experiments. And so you, if you go on reading in the dispersion literature, you can get very confused. And one of the things that really gets confusing is dispersivity is dependent on scale. All right. So assimilation capacity. North America is built on suburbs. Suburbs got going in the U.S. in a major way after the Second World War. And as you well know, if you've visited America, Los Angeles, or, or Phoenix, or wherever, basically it's, it's suburb heaven. And that means you have millions of people living out there in their single family homes, uh, each with a well and each with a septic system. And the whole idea of a septic system is you basically flush your toilet and that's the end of it. Because it goes into the ground and, and, and the nitrogen gets converted to nitrate uh, and, uh, and it gets assimilated. Okay. So a good septic system that's properly operating uh, basically converts the nitrogen. It converts the nitrogen to nitrate. Okay. So if your septic system is behaving properly, it's a nitrate production system and the nitrate goes into groundwater okay, and it travels. But the whole the whole, the whole early literature produced by, by basically waste disposal engineers and whatnot was that we'd have an assimilation capacity and they had a whole routine of equations that you'd use to decide how big your plot of land had to be and how far your septic system had to be uh, from your well. All of which turned out to be nonsense uh, in terms of how things really behave in the ground. All right. And, and uh, so this becomes to the fore. Uh, these slides are taken from my colleague, Dennis Le 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 LeBlanc at the USGS. Okay, this is Cape Cod, which is basically sand. And Cape Cod has one of the world's uh, worst nitrate problems. There are lots of serious nitrate problems in, in this world, uh, but this is a world-class problem because there are too many people living on Cape Cod uh, with septic systems, et cetera, et cetera. Now you could say, well, to just, just basically take them all off of aquifer water and pipe in water from somewhere else, but the, and you could do that. But the problem is that the nitrate then uh, basically causes the estuaries to become eutrophic. So phosphate causes eutrophication in lakes, nitrate causes eutrophication in estuaries uh, along oceans, and basically nitrate contamination in across the world is a big deal. Uh, in many cases, much of it coming from sewage, uh, from septic seas. And what people are finding now is when you, farm, when you sample for pharmaceuticals, uh, it's amazing what you can find. And when Beth Parker and students sample for pharmaceuticals in just farm wells outside of Guelph, uh, they typically find um, ibuprofen. So for those of you that, that solve your headaches with ibuprofen, you can be fairly sure that you're contributing to, uh, to some type of water pollution, uh, such as groundwater contamination. And there are other very uh, diagnostic food additives. So, and we hydrogeologists would say, that's great. We have another tracer. Okay, we know when they went in the ground, et cetera, et cetera. They're all at parts per trillion and whatnot and so forth. So if you believe what we're being told, none of this matters from a point of view of human health. But basically, there's almost no pristine groundwater to be found now 
uh, in North America. All right. So, uh, uh, so I became a local expert on aquitards because of my work at this radioactive waste disposal site in, in the late 60s and early 70s. And I was invited by the city of Winnipeg to go back to Winnipeg after I moved to Waterloo uh, and study the aquitard there to see if it was suitable for bearing basically municipal garbage. And so we have about uh, 10 meters or so of clay uh, and then we've got a, a, a regional aquifer and we have a very low potentiometric surface. So the question that I was supposed to answer was, can we dig pits in the clay and, and put our garbage in uh, with no liners, etc., and would the aquitard uh, basically protect the aquifer below? That's a question addressed to me. And, and as always in that era, I would drill some holes and put some pipes in the holes and then we would get water out of the pipes and measure it for what's, what's relevant. And what's relevant? Well, who knows back in that era, but, uh, but uh, Peter Fritz, um, who then uh, was a German, who came to Canada, did marvelous work at Waterloo, and he went back to become uh, head of, of the um, Helmholtz Institute uh, in uh, Leipzig. Uh, he established an isotope lab at Waterloo then in the, uh, in the early 70s. And uh, so Peter would say, John, when you have some water from some of your pipes, send it to my lab and we'll analyze for it. And I would say, well, Peter, you know, what are we going to learn? And he would say, well, who knows, John, but it'll be a wonderful adventure. And it was. So tritium then is this uh, very slightly radioactive rain fallout that was happening big time back in the 60s. Okay. And, and then there was the international ban on atmospheric testing, so the tritium function uh, tapered off drastically, but it's still a very valuable uh, tracer. So I got a tritium profile. And... Uh, this is what it looked like, and it didn't make any sense to me at all because I was sure the clay was fractured, and I was sure that water was running quickly down the fractures. So the profile made no sense. Uh, now, O18, again, is something very useful to run, and anywhere you are in the world, your, your standard recharge water has an O18 typical value. And in Winnipeg, it's about minus 14. So this, this graph was even more puzzling. Minus 14 water or so at the top, and minus 19 water at the bottom. Oh boy, I had no idea what this data meant. But I couldn't write my report because I had no idea what the data meant. Minus 19 water at the bottom. Gee, that's. Uh, so, where would we get minus 19 water? Like the old, per mil water. Um, the only place you can find water like that is in the Canadian Arctic. So, what are we doing with Canadian Arctic water in the middle of a clay deposit beneath the city of Winnipeg where the groundwater is supposed to be traveling quickly through the fractures? So, that was a puzzle. Uh, and I puzzled about it uh, for many, many months and then at a New Year's Eve party at Peter Fritz's place, New Year's Eve, going into 1977, uh, an Australian a hydrologist, isotope hydrologist, who had been in Britain, was passing through town to see Peter. And I guess I must have been showing everybody I could meet these curves. And I would say, like, I got these funny curves and I got a ready report. What do you think they mean? And so Graham Allison, the Australian isotope hydrologist, said, well, John, you should read a paper by a British hydrogeologist by the name of... of uh, Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster with the U.S. Uh, with the British Geological Survey, and Stephen Foster had had the same puzzle uh, a few years earlier, but it was in the British chalk, uh, and he was puzzling over over tritium and nitrate, and I missed his paper because the title had had chalk in it, and I, I you know, <coughs> being lazy, would read the title, and if it didn't look like it was totally relevant, not read the paper. So the answer to my question was inherent in this paper, and if Graham Allison hadn't told me that, I'd probably never have gotten to the paper. Uh, anyway, and so what, what uh, Foster had done, a beautiful piece of research, was he basically figured out the dispersion must be governing uh, the, the transport. And he set up a little mathematical model where he had a single fracture, and he had his porous chalk, and he would let the tritium go into the fracture, and it would diffuse out in the matrix. Okay, and that causes an extreme retardation of the tritium front. And that was his puzzle. Why is the tritium so, so retarded relative to where the water, water should be? Tritium is water, but tritium is a tracer, and it behaves according to, to uh, fixed laws. And at the Rome IH conference, I invited uh, Stephen Foster out for dinner because I wanted to pick his brains and find out how did he figure it out. And a couple of colleagues were with me, and we had a delightful evening, and he explained how he figured out that diffusion had to be the issue. He actually figured it out by figuring there's got to be something here, and he went back to his undergraduate textbooks, and he found he found dispersion as a he found diffusion as a process. And uh, that evening, as I walked back to the hotel, I, I said to myself, "Would I have ever done that? Would I have ever figured it out?" 
by going back to the textbooks? And I think the answer would be no. I don't think I would ever have figured it out, but he did. Uh, now, there's another Canadian who came upon diffusion as a very important process in contaminant hydrogeology at about the same time, independently. Uh, Robert Quigley, uh, now deceased, who published many, many papers on this topic at the University of Western Ontario, which is only a mile from uh, an hour's drive from Waterloo, independently in the Civil Engineering Department, discovered diffusion because he was studying contaminant migration beneath landfills. He basically had a grant to go out beneath landfills on clay in southern Ontario and see where the contaminants were. And he found profiles that can only be explained uh, with, uh, with uh, diffusion, 1D diffusion calculations. And he became a, a good uh, scientist and, and colleague for a long time. All right. So having discovered diffusion, i.e. discovered diffusion in the world of contaminant hydrogeology, thanks to others discovering the process, uh, then my next step was, well, why don't we go seeing where we can find basically uh, paleo water in various aquitards across Canada? Because that's what we have then in that aqu aqu aquitard in Winnipeg. That's paleo water. Okay, that's paleo glacial water that hasn't been flushed out, even though it's fractured. So I had a grad student who came to us from Quebec and said, Donald, go out to these aquitards uh, and put in uh, some prosometers in detail and get some profiles and let's see if we can find paleo water. And he went out to clay plains and went on and so forth and, and uh, went out to an area here where if you, once having been convinced that diffusion is important, uh, and then if you have clays that don't have many fractures, things should be diffusing up and things should be diffusing down and you should basically see the evidence by looking at the profiles. And that's what he did and he got beautiful profiles. And uh, we went out to Lake Agassiz. Lake Agassiz, which the name is very well, Agassiz's name is very well known in Canada because of this gigantic Lake Agassiz, etc. And we got beautiful profiles there. And in fact, these profiles were published in Science, my only paper in, in, in Science. Science generally doesn't accept papers from hydrogeologists because they don't think we're scientists. So, so uh, and nature, the same thing too. Basically, the letters I get back from Science is, well, it's probably really good science and all that, but we don't think we have a readership for that. And, and every once in a while, my colleagues and I submitted papers of science just to see what answer we're going to get. And then we argue with them, but we always lose. Anyway, <laughs> we, disguised, we disguised this paper uh, because we basically sold it under paleo, paleo climate investigations. Ah, science likes that. <laughs> but in our world, this is very important, uh, beyond uh, paleo climate. Uh, and in Canada, one of our major waste disposal facilities is basically burial of, of, uh, of hazardous uh, chemical waste in deep pits in clay. And then we cover them up and we call that waste entombment. And this concept was put in the literature in the 1960s. Um, and eventually, uh, the, eventually the nuclear industry uh, uh, realized that that's where you should, that's where you should build your, your deep geological repositories. Okay, so the nuclear industry should have caught on to that much, much earlier. They shouldn't have been fooling around with things like granite. All right, so in North America, things were being driven in a different direction by their laws, and chlorinated solvents were being found, and in the late 70s uh, and 80s. Uh, and the father of this type of research is, is Frederick Swilley, the same guy who did the uh, gasoline research. And he was the only person in the world that really saw the future when it came to this particular type of contaminant that became the most, contaminant, the most important contaminant in the industrialized world. He published this paper in 1981, and he published it in a rather obscure place and nobody noticed it. But basically the DNAPL paradigm it was published by, by Schwilly in 1981, but wasn't discovered in North America by people like me and whatnot until 1983 or 1984. And when we realized that we had something on our hands here and we found Schwilly's work, we found that he basically explained uh, the basis of it. And he published his, uh, his, his life's work on this topic that was from 77 to 84 in German translated and went on and so forth. So the Dean Apple paradigm kind of goes like this. The Dean Apple goes into the ground and it sinks down. And, and one of the, the interesting uh, uh, changes in paradigm is, is this one uh, done by my colleague Beth Parker in her PhD thesis. So Beth figured out that when Dean Apple goes into a porous, uh, fractured porous media, like fractured sedimentary rock or fractured clay, and if the fractures are thin, then the Dean Apple will diffuse, of course, and dissolve. But if the fractures are thin and you don't keep loading it up with Dean Apple, then in fact the Dean Apple disappears. Your Dean Apple is gone. It 
hasn't gone by degradation or not. Basically, it's been transferred to the aqueous phase, and it ends up then going into the into the matrix. Now, getting back to this business of doing laboratory studies, so the Germans, or the, sorry, the Danes recognized that they need because Denmark's overlain basically by fractured clay everywhere, and 98% of the Danes get their water from groundwater. So they were driven then to learn more about these fractured clay aquitarts. And they developed the Danish technique for large columns. So here we are with Peter Jorgensen from the Danish Geological Survey uh, helping us apply the Danish method. Okay, and we're going out to an experiment that we conducted at Borden where we poured uh, basically a free product uh, Dean Apple into the Borden aquifer. Okay, and we could do that because we put sheet pile cells in, and I declared the aquitard to be, be tight. So I was the boss because I was the project leader. Okay, and so here's our column of clay, etc., cetera, and, uh, uh, and we're taking the clay, and we want to learn about the, the travel of, 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 uh, of uh, Dean apples in, uh, in clays, in this case, in a fractured clay. And you can see the fractures by the, uh, by the uh, diffusion halos of weathering very sophisticated methodology. So when you get these samples back to the lab and you repressurize them, you can, you can be reasonably assured that your sample is like it was in the field. You can repressurize it up to the same uh, stress conditions. And this is what uh, Beth Parker and her, her master's students found. They found that they could actually find the fractures by, by mapping the diffusion halos as long as you take lots of fractures. Really uh, interesting, and then she does a lot of this at work then at real field sites where you go out to fractured sedimentary rock and you map the halos. Now, uh, but one of the pr reasons why I don't want to, to mention this uh, is that science moves forward in a whole variety of ways, and then mostly moves forward in my field, our field, by getting data that don't make sense. It almost rarely moves forward by getting data that you think you're going to get. So here we have a large experiment at Borden, and we're going to pour in our 770 liters of Dean Apple, but before we did that, we filled it up to water, which filled it up with water to show that it doesn't leak water. Okay, and then we poured in our Dean Apple, and the Dean Apple settles out in a very complex way, and this is a very homogeneous aquifer, keep in mind, and some of the Dean Apple got to the bottom. And here's the geology. It's a glacial lake deposit, and it's, it's relatively unweathered, at least to my eye, etc., and it looked pretty good. And at the same time, I had a grad student out, outside of this cell then uh, auguring a hole to put in some pressure transducers just for fun to study the aquitard. We weren't, we weren't worried about leaking Dean Apple. And they're auguring their holes, and then up comes out of the ground the augers from outside of the cell with basically the dyed red Dean Apple. Whoa, like what's that all about? That means we have a totally failed experiment on our hands. We have the Dean Apple having escaped from this very expensive double walled cheap piling cell. Uh, and I wasn't too worried because tenure protects professors in, in, in Canada very strongly. I was worried about our research money. And, and uh, then uh, Beth and others investigated this and they found that the Dean Apple moved down through fractures and moved along the uh, sand layers in, in the microbeds and you could see this by these diffusion halos. Uh, the point being that, that the Dean Apple enters fractures that are so small that in fact, when you do hydraulic tests, you can't, you can't, the detection limit of the hydraulic test is too crude to decide whether or not there are fractures there or not. Isn't that amazing? And that's why Dean Apples moved so, through so many aquitards across the globe in an unexpected way. Aquitards that were supposed to be tight and are tight for other contaminants aren't tight with respect to Dean Apple. This is our conceptual model. Now, uh, so we're going to go back to this. So the question then at the Borden site, so I was wrong. My conclusion on the aquitard wasn't correct, and I was supposed to be an aquitard expert. Okay, and when you're an expert and you get it wrong, it's good if you can say, I did everything possible, but somehow I was wrong. It's not so good if you, if you basically say, well, I really, I missed a really important method, and if I'd applied it, I would have gotten the answer. So I missed a really important method. I should have basically done a hydraulic head profile. And to do a hydraulic head profile, the simplest way is to put a multi-level system in the ground. So when you drill a hole now, in general, it's better to put in a multi-level system than to put in a standard monitoring well. And so we put in a couple of multi-level systems, a new type of system developed by a, a person in California who became a student at Waterloo. And here we have 14 data points. So these are 14 uh, uh, basically hydraulic head points. 
And the shape of this profile then should have told me, if I'd had such a profile, it would have told me immediately that the upper three quarters of this aquitard has to be fractured. And if I'd known that, then we couldn't have done the experiment. So it all worked out rather well. Uh, I didn't know it, so we could do the experiment. We learned a whole bunch of stuff, but the, 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 the Dean apple didn't go all the way through the aquitard, which would, would have been worse. So my assumption about the aquitard uh, was that it was, uh, would have been uh, unfractured, and if that was the case, then we should have seen a head profile like that dashed line. And you don't see any of these in textbooks, and it's one of the many things in the Freeze Cherry textbook that's not there that would be in another version. Uh, interpreting hydraulic head profiles, and it has to be the starting point in many cases for many hydrogeological endeavors. And now, if you have enough money and whatnot, if you're dealing with rock and things that are uh, easier than just drilling a simple hole, there are all sorts of devices you can buy and put in your hole. And I'll just finish up here. So uh, contaminant hydrogeology has moved a long way, and we know some stuff. I think many of the important things that we really need should know to serve society well, we don't yet know. So people say, oh, contaminant hydrology has become a mature science. And I don't think it's a mature science in many, many respects. It's a science, at least as a science now, and it's got some sophistication, but it's not a mature science. There's lots to do, lots of research to be done. And one of the big commotions around the globe is then is shale gas development, which is mostly banned in Europe, which is done in the U.S. all over the place. It's done in British Columbia and uh, Alberta, and it's banned in eastern Canada. People don't want to do it. They don't want to do it because they're afraid that things are going to leak up and contaminate groundwater. And, and I was on the Canadian government shale gas panel, and, and uh, out of all of this, the, our conclusion was that the single most important uncertainty in shale gas development is basically methane migration, stray gas. We all know, almost know nothing about it, and for those areas that ban shale gas development, that's not unreasonable based on how little we know about shale gas. And we can produce plumes like this. Um, and when I, produce, when I do this at a, at a meeting, some people say, John, I think this is nonsense. I think the way you've drawn this plume is physically impossible. But, but there's reasons for drawing it like this, and there's reasons for drawing it in other ways. And when I look at all this, I say we're right back to where we were in the 70s in our debate about dispersion of solutes uh, in sandy aquifers. We really don't know much at all. Uh, and the latest experiment being done as we speak at Canadian Forces Base Borden is basically pumping in some methane in the Borden aquifer to see what happens. So we know so little about methane going into aquifers that uh, we can justify doing a Borden experiment. And this is my, uh, my last slide here, I think. So we know a lot about porous media contaminant hydrogeology, a lot but not all. And we know something about, uh, about aquitard hydrogeology. And we know very little about fractured rock hydrogeology. And in many cases, it's fractured rock hydrogeology where the big societal questions are. But by not knowing enough about aquitard hydrology, then we don't know enough about layered aquitard aquifer systems. So that's why I'm saying that, that contaminant hydrogeology is still an immature science. And, and if you want to understand contaminant hydrogeology, then you probably shouldn't read these books. Uh, they're either misleading or uh, wrong or off track. Uh, and uh, the problem now is that there's very little synthesis of science being done. Like nobody has written a detailed textbook on contaminant hydrogeology. There's one that has that title produced about 10 years ago, but it really isn't a very good textbook. It wasn't written by a contaminant hydrogeologist. So we reached a stage in science where people are too busy to actually synthesize information and write books. And, and the publishing industry is in kind of chaos and professors are too busy and so in fact what Students need to read on this topic is not available for you to read. You'd have to dig it out of the literature or listen to your professor's lectures. And these are my concluding remarks here. Um, basically, as we go forward with science, we need to recognize data that doesn't fit preconceived notions. Um, and new types of data then are, there are all sorts of possibilities for new types of data, new types of isotopes, new types of temperature measurements and whatnot. And, um, Many of the opportunities in science, as you well know, are between the disciplines, and that means there's got to be collaboration, etc. Uh, modeling by itself, uh, we need models in any study that I'm involved in. We have to have a modeler involved and whatnot. That's absolutely necessary. But there's a lot of uh, jeopardy in models that are, are unverified. And in general, you can't, you can't verify a groundwater flow model using basically groundwater flow data. Okay? You can calibrate a model, but you can't verify it. You can only verify it by other types of data, such as isotopes, etc.
Anyway, and my last slide here is meant for a North American audience. I don't think you're in such bad shape here in Europe. But in North America in general now, in the US and Canada, you can't get a research application accepted unless you claim you've got a real nice hypothesis and you know how to test it. Because that's the way physicists and chemists do their science. That's not the way the science of contaminant hydrogeology is developed at all. In general, almost all the important advances have, followed, have fallen out of puzzling data that have been gathered, uh, usually for some other purpose, or like in my career, gathered as part of a fishing trip. Thanks for your attention. I've gone a little bit long here, but anyway. So you say there's no definitive works that can help people understand what is really <coughs> important in contaminant hydrogeology. Are there any websites or aren't there certain publications that are being done to well, help that? I guess the problem, the problem is if you're in a research community studying some little niche, um, you're going to know what to read and you're, you're going to know who to talk to. So in my case, generally I read, I read to people I know that I would trust their work in general or their recommendations. The literature, of course, is, is just mushrooming papers coming in from all over. And then if you go into the literature, if you think of the dispersion literature, if you went into that literature and you weren't living and breathing that topic, what would you believe? And how could you understand it? It took dozens of people went out arguing about dispersion to finally get a solution after you know, 15 years of arguing. Now, there are good journals, of course, and there are good papers. But not only are there not textbooks being published where somebody or some group of people sit down to synthesize it, there are almost no review papers. And it used to be in the scientific literature, you would go, you would go and look at a review paper. Um, and review papers are hard to write. That means that somebody who knows a lot has to sit down and take a month or two off and whatnot and synthesize the information. And in academia, you, do, you almost get no credit for a textbook, at least in the North American system. And review papers aren't rated very highly. So the reward system in North American science and engineering, in fact, is the reverse in many cases uh, of what we need. Uh, I was visited the University of Minnesota a couple of weeks ago, and some very big, excellent American universities, and I asked them, like, and I met two or three professors who were doing amazing work. And I said, oh, gee, you know, why don't you write a book on this? They said, oh, we'd never write a book on that because you don't get credit in our system for books. Amazing. An amazing state of affairs. So what do students do? Students basically tap into, in, into the web and they buy textbooks and whatnot. And you get, you get some information wherever you can get it. Uh, and, and, and we think, oh, my land. Like, do they know who's writing it? Do they know the nature? Do they know? If they're, are they reading the old paradigm? Are they reading the new paradigm? So really, we're in a crazy state of affairs um, in terms of, of, of we professionals you know, claiming to do work that, that has some reliability in a world of exploding knowledge. Yep. So in many cases, you have to go to the right conferences uh, and try and figure out who does know something so that when you read, you know who you're reading. Uh, and uh, like it's amazing in the shale gas literature. One of the reasons why, why shale gas is banned in so many places is that when the public asks questions uh, and, they, and, and then the media go to ask academics for their opinions, they get, they get all sorts of opinions across the spectrum. Okay? Because almost all the things that are important with respect to shale gas development have to do with groundwater. So little is known that, it's, that the science is, is, is in its infancy, so all that you have is really scientific debate. And so who, who do you believe? Interesting. Interesting, but kind of crazy. I just want you, you mentioned, you know, shale gas is a big yeah. topic to come and how you think research will evolve. Because when you look at Dean Apple, yeah. a lot of, it was recognized there was a problem and science yeah. can help, like, yeah. Um, yeah. to show it. And then you go to shale gas often. Yeah. And a lot of the, the attitude is we don't have a problem and science will might oh, just it's, show it's, that we have a problem. So it, we don't really it's, want it's, to support it, research. It's disgraceful. It's so I, I was chair of the Canadian government's uh, expert panel uh, on, on, on fracking. 
And that happened you know, sort of three or four years ago. And so we had a big panel of 16 experts, all very distinguished people. And I was the chair. Um, and, and first of all, to even call a panel an expert panel is misleading. Because of the 16 people on the panel, there are only three that I would say are experts. So what is, what is an expert on, on shale gas development and impacts on the environment? I mean, to be an expert, you at least have to, stu have to study the topic before. So we were all experts on something uh, which would have something, some relevance to shale gas development. So there are three people that actually published papers that were close to or something to do with shale gas development. And the rest of us were just basically scientists who were gathered in a room to argue. Uh, as you would expect, the Americans were very poor, poor, polarized between left and right. Uh, and the two right uh, hand, uh, right uh, political Americans, one from Stanford and the other from Colorado School of Mines, they resigned because they didn't like the wording of our report. It, it, was, it was great fun. Um, the Canadian government tried to censor our report, which wasn't great fun, uh, because Canadian government's position, this is the government that we just tur turfed out of office after nine terrible years. Um, that government's uh, opinion basically was we know all we need to know about shale gas development. And for you scientists that are saying otherwise, you're just a bunch of uh, academics who want research grants. That basically was our federal government's opinion. So the eastern provinces, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, have all banned shale gas development. And there's one province, the province of New Brunswick, that where there's a group of lawyers suing the New Brunswick government, the provincial government, for irresponsible behavior. Their irresponsible behavior is that they allowed several shale gas wells to be drilled without having proper scientific information. And uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to go to that province and give a talk and support that group, uh, uh, basically suing the New Brunswick government. So but why, would sue, why would citizens sue their government? To try and scare the hell out of the government so, in fact, they don't ignore, they don't ignore science. And when they do talk about science, they don't talk nonsense bad state of affairs in North America in general uh, on science. We're looking to Europe for leadership. <laughs> oh, so I might mention. So, so colleagues uh, of mine and others have decided to redo the Freeze Cherry textbook. It's called Groundwater 2.0. So they've got the publisher to give the publishing rights back to Alan Fries and myself. And we're giving it to Hydrogelis Without Borders. And then there's a committee that Alan and I are on of 12 very distinguished colleagues. And we're the, we're the, the overseeing committee. And the various people who know an awful lot are going to redo all the various sections of that book and, and all the new topics. So the book is going to be too big to publish, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And then who's the book being written for? The Freeze Cherry book was written for undergraduates, but it was too dense for undergraduates. So it was really written for graduate students. So in this, in, and it's going to be a web book. So it's going, to, it's going to be a Wikipedia book. So in essence, it's going to go on the web, you know, next year or whatever. And it's going to, and, and it's going to say, here it is. Uh, and then it's going to say to anybody, if you can figure out a better way of explaining this section of the book, or if we've got so many mistakes, it needs to be totally fixed. Or if you think there's a topic that's missing, then write it, and we'll look at it, and we'll add it. And your names will be there. And so it'll be an evolving textbook of the knowledge of, of hydrogeology. And we're hoping that that, will at least, that that will at least provide a place that if you're interested in just about any you know, topic in, in hydrogeology, you can go and get a start with material written by people who, who have credentials doesn't mean that they're right, of course. It just means that they've got credentials and it's been reviewed and whatnot and so forth. And I think that that really is, is a really exciting uh, idea. Uh, and maybe it'll be used for teaching all over the globe, uh, or maybe it won't, but it's intended to be widely usable. It's intended then, when you, want to, when you want to learn about Darcy's Law, you can read about Darcy's Law elegantly taught with all the right little visuals. If you want to know about more, you can press a button and then go down to the next level. So that's a real exciting experiment that apparently is the first of its kind. Um, so that, that's the good news. At least we've gotten, gotten that far. Yeah. Yeah. Will it be just open like a website? It'll be Everyone. open like a website, but you have to pay for it. <laughs> and why do you have to pay for it? It's not that the authors are greedy. You have to pay for it, and we haven't figured that out yet, how much you have to pay and so forth. 
But the idea is that the money go, will go to hydrogeologists without borders. And it's like doctors without borders and engineers without borders, etc., which is an organization that tended to bring hydrogeological knowledge uh, to developing countries. Not to install wells and do all of that stuff, because there's all sorts of organizations out there doing good by stalling wells. The weakness in almost all this work going on in, in developing countries that has to do with groundwater, as near as I've been able to tell, is that, the, is that the hydrogeological framework is generally missing. And so the idea will be that this textbook will be, uh, will, will be used to help fund that organization. And so we hope that big companies will buy it, buy the rights to use it in their organization and so forth. And they should pay a lot of money. Okay, and then the universities would buy the rights for it. So, that, it's, so it's a very new model then on raising money. And so uh, the, the Fries Cherry Book, uh, you know, when I, when I worked on that with Al Fries, one of the reasons to work on it was so it will, the students will buy the book uh, and, and they'll read the chapters and, and then I won't have to write Darcy's Law on the Blackboard because they'll have read it. And they'll have read it explained better than I can probably do it on, on the, the day that I'm trying to teach it. And, and I found that in fact the students didn't want to read the book because they want to be taught. I understand that. Like the book is a boring thing. Like it's a dense book. It's hard to, hard to learn from it. Um, so so as, as, a, as a book to educate undergraduates, it, it was a complete failure. Uh, and my children, my children have told me so. They both took courses that had this book. Um, I said, Dad, how could you write such a dense book that's so hard to learn from? And it's because professors have already learned that stuff. So when we tend to write books and one and so forth, we, we don't tend to, to, to write and, and whatnot so that it's understandable to others. So this, this wiki book is in, intended to overcome that. If you want to learn about Darcy's Law, you can learn it from a left viewpoint and a right viewpoint in whichever way your mind functions. And then, you know, I've learned from psychologists, minds, functions, minds, minds function in different ways. And we all kind of know that. So we have to be taught in different ways. So books need to be written in different ways. Videos and animation. Yes, absolutely. And, and when you see some of the wonderful videos and animation, like the technology has arrived. Uh, to look inside the pores and see what's going on inside the pores and see the molecules jumping around and diffusing and all that stuff. So for those of us that, that, that learn visually, there's a huge opportunity. Some of you learn mathematically and you don't need the visuals, etc. So the mathematics needs to, to be there. And if I could just have one more second here. So there's a very distinguished, uh, uh, and he died I think a year ago, uh, pet, uh, a porous media uh, flow physicist at Colorado State University, Art Corey. Uh, he's kind of the god in, in, in porous media flow, etc. And 25 years ago, I was visiting that university, and Art was well retired by that time. He said, John, I have to talk to you. And he was really anxious to talk to me. So I went into his office, and he sat me down. He said, John, you've got the development of the fluid potential wrong. Like, like we've got the development of the fluid potential wrong, and it's one of the most fundamental things in the book, and nobody's told us. And I said, well, Art, yeah, well, but we took it from M. King Hubbard, probably the most distinguished uh, geoscientist the world has ever seen. And for most of us, M. King Hubbard, whatever he says, is, is it's like the Bible. And so Art said, well, you know, M. King Hubbard gets things wrong sometimes. And he basically went up to the blackboard and derived the fluid potential elegantly without a bunch of mass without a bunch of math, but with just clear thinking physics. So probably all the people, including ourselves, when you've looked at that potential development, one and so forth, that you've been taught, the professors like me trying to convince ourselves we actually understood, we really we didn't. Uh, and so we're really looking forward then to finding the most elegant, clear, correct ways that, that the science can be explained. So with, with yeah. Who is leading Groundwater 2.0? Who is leading the, the project? Oh, well, um, one of my former grad students, uh, Dr. Kathy Ryan at the University of Calgary, took on the job of, of, uh, of, uh, of organizing it, uh, uh, arranging for a meetings of the panel, of communicating with a publisher. The publisher basically for a year said, you can't have the rights. And that would mean we kind of have to start over. Now they just turned rights. So she's leading it. Uh, and. And then Alfries and I are the, are the uh, honorary uh, heads, and we'll pay enough attention to make sure that the vision is still there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, to get back to the practical matter of plumes. <laughs> yeah, plumes. Because you, you, you've shown several um, uh, plots of plumes yeah. at the, the field scale. Yeah. And I was, 
actually yeah, amazing they were so neat uh, yeah. because you, you emphasize yeah. also that heterogeneity yeah, yeah. means that we must go in the field and yeah. Yeah. you know take measurements not just infer that we yeah. know the the, yeah. the late scale of the yeah. Uh, yeah. the lateral and the longitudinal late, late scale of the, yeah. those plumes so well, my question is kind of uh, uh, have, have you ever seen any crazy plumes you know that oh. are just not yeah. nice like that because they no, we I, have the impression I, that if we know the flow field then we can just you know draw well I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because when your input function, your input source is nice and neat, and you're in a, a sand and gravel aquifer, uh, a sand and gravel aquifer without other complications, then you can expect a neat plume. But many sites and whatnot, the contaminants have kind of gone in the ground in a, in a crazy way that you don't know, and so that can cause the plume to be unneat, particularly at chlorinated solvent sites and whatnot. Uh, and then. And then you can have hydrogeology that's not neat. So, in fact, I'm really glad you asked that question because really, you know, what I've ended up here with, with is a little bit misleading. I, I got into the dispersion thing. But so we in North America decided that we've learned all we want to know about dispersion. And we moved on. And at the, at the Rome meeting, uh, I went to two or three talks, I think mostly by Germans, who were busy studying dispersion again. Like I'm thinking, what are they doing? Uh, don't they know that we've learned all we want to know about that? Uh, but these are very, very good scientists, and by the time I got through listening to their talks, uh, I think my conclusion was, was, that, that was that the story we developed in North America fitted all the data we had, and we got tired and moved on. But in, in fact, I, I think there's really good reason to look at dispersion again in more complex hydrogeological environments. And there were some really neat simulations by a professor at Stuttgart. I think his name is Cyprik. What is his name? Sepka. Sepka. That's it. And he had some really neat simulations where he got dispersion coefficients that were way, way out of line. And he did them by putting in the structure of the geology then that was obviously different from what we've been dealing with. So um, I, I think uh, I think there's... There's good reason to sort of reopen, reopen the dispersion story. Yeah, and 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 so what the what the what what they're trying to do then in Europe, as near as I can tell, is going out to gravel pits and whatnot, and and trying to basically look at the geological structure, and then kind of couple that to the groundwater flow and the dispersion, and that would seem to be a very worthy endeavor. Now, doing the easy science in many cases is fast and cheap. So basically running these experiments, yeah, they took a year or two and one and so forth. But going, opening up the dispersion question again uh, to go at the next level of detail, like that's, that's going to be long, hard work. And we North Americans leave that to Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> I think there might have been a slight bias in the selection of, selection of field sites in the sense that you would prefer a field site that, is, that has complexity, so you can show that there is complexity. Oh. But there is a, you know, a minimal complexity there, yeah. complexities between... Yeah. Coarse gravel and fine sand, yeah. not yeah, yeah. You know, the mix of the two. And therefore, you focus oh. your intention on this. Sure, the bias was towards uh, towards um, uh, aquifers uh, that uh, are, uh, are are sand or, or sand and fine gravel uh, that uh, uh, are are shallow and easily accessible. So we we, we we biased it towards simplicity. So we've got the, the Borden aquifer is a beach sand. Okay. The Cape Cod aquifer is a, an alluvial sand, and then I think the Danes did an experiment in some other sand. So there's a strong bias there. We've excluded layered aquifers uh, and, and whatnot and so forth. And then there's the famous attempt at such a tracer experiment done in Mississippi where they, they ended up doing it in a very complex uh, uh, aquifer and, and got all crazy results that nobody can understand. They're still trying to figure out. But, but that was a worthy endeavor. The fact that they couldn't figure it out and got crazy results has to do with the complexity of the geology. And within that, then, the fact the geology was complex, their, their input functions and all of that were kind of screwed up because they didn't know what they were doing. So that, that those are good, good comments. OK. Good. I, I think we stop here no, yeah. at the moment. But we, it was very inspiring. I think we didn't normally organize a couple of bottles of wine afterwards, but I'm sure we have somewhere in an arm or maybe we could call them that. But we can maybe meet in that coffee place in the second floor or have a coffee and tea. Those that want to spend a bit uh, a, a moment. And thanks again for this very Thank nice, you. inspiring lecture. Thanks for the good discussion. It's a pleasure to meet.